Let's talk about noise. So the first thing we need to do is we need to understand the properties of sound. Sound, in its simplest definition, is the vibration of air molecules. Amplitude is the sound pressure that can be perceived as loudness. Frequency is the cycles per second, usually measured in hertz, perceived as pitch. Sound is produced by objects moving back and forth, compressing and rarefying air. This process creates pressures that are higher and lower than atmospheric pressure. This is then spread in a wave, which can be graphed in two dimensions. These pressure waves have an amplitude, which is the size of the wave, that represents the volume, and a wavelength, or frequency, that is the pitch. There are two major properties of sound. Condensation, which is when air particles vibrate around a fixed point, and rarefaction, which is when a wave of vibration spreads outward. No sound can exist in a vacuum because there are no molecules to vibrate, such as in the completely empty areas of space. So if a noise is just air molecules vibrating, how do we actually hear it? Humans have the ability to hear due to the complex system of signal transduction within our inner ear. Sound waves enter the outer ear, travel through the ear canal to the eardrum, also known as the tympanic membrane. The sound wave causes the membrane to vibrate, which then sends these vibrations through three tiny bones or ossicles in the inner ear named the malleus, incus, and stapes. These bones, in that order, convert sound vibrations from air to fluid vibrations in the cochlea, a specialized structure within the ear. Fluid travels through the cochlea and vibrates the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane is the elastic partition from the beginning to the end of the cochlea. It splits it into the upper and lower part. It's lined with cilia, which are hair cells that bend, and has stereocilia at the tips, which can open up for chemical reactions to process sound. These stereocilia bump against the overlying structure and bend, and this bending causes the channels to open. When the channels open, chemicals rush into the cell, depolarizing it and generating an electrical signal. The auditory nerve carries the electrical signal to the brain, where the signal is translated into a sound that we recognize and understand. There are differences in hearing due to differences in the anatomical structure of the ear, there are sex-based differences, and there are age-based differences. Sounds come in different frequencies related to pitch. Consequently, different locations along the basal or membrane are differentially sensitive to the frequency content of these vibrations due to specialized hair cells which are sensitive to different frequencies. We call this structured arrangement of hair cells the tonotopic map. Research has shown that the spiral or snail shape of the cochlea leads to increased sensitivity to low frequency sounds, and that sounds with high frequency are detected and coded at the base of the membrane or the beginning of the cochlea, and low frequency sounds are detected primarily at the apex or the end of the membrane. The difference in shape and frequency coding means that we're more likely to lose the ability to hear high pitch noises because we lose hearing in that area first, which is most likely caused by low pitch frequencies which propagate throughout the entire cochlea, while higher pitch frequencies have a hard time reaching the apex. This ultimately means that there's more accumulated damage near the base of the cochlea. So how do we quantify and measure sound? Sound intensity, or acoustic intensity, is defined as the sound power per unit area. The SI unit for sound intensity is the watt per meter square. However, this isn't an entirely useful way to describe sounds, so there are other units and systems in place. It's common to express sound intensity using the log scale, which we would commonly know as the decibel scale. This is possible because sound intensity in watts per meter squared increases exponentially. The decibel is a logarithmic way of describing this ratio. It's a ratio of the current intensity to the lowest intensity with respect to the minimum threshold for human hearing. The decibel scale can help us determine how loud something is relative to the threshold of hearing. An important note to consider and that we'll address later in this lecture is that typically we notice that hearing loss starts when we experience sounds that are greater than 85 decibels. Now, a decibel refers to the actual loudness of a sound, but it doesn't relate to how we actually perceive that sound. Sound loudness actually varies from person to person due to the aforementioned differences in structure and other biological differences. For example, a 60 decibel sound with a frequency of 1000 Hz sounds louder than a 60 decibel sound with a frequency of 100 or 10,000 Hz. This is because we perceive very low and very high frequency sounds to be quieter than they are. This poses a risk for hearing damage because we may turn up the volume of low frequency noises and hurt our ears without realizing how loud the sound actually is. So to account for the sound differences that we actually hear, we have other measures. Fawns are the relationship between decibels and frequency and give us a measure of how loud you perceive the sound to be. By definition, one fawn is equal to one decibel at 1000 Hertz. In a study to investigate the relationship between fawns and decibels, 
a 60 fawn curve was created where different frequencies were played and people were asked to compare it to the sound level of a 60 decibel signal at 1000 hertz. So they played different frequencies and adjusted the decibel level to achieve the same perceived loudness at 1000 hertz. They repeated this at different frequencies along the 60 fawn curve. They found that lower frequencies below 1000 hertz and higher frequencies above 4000 hertz are perceived to be quieter than they actually are. But the problem is that fawns doesn't really give us an easy way of figuring out how much louder something sounds. It doesn't give us a comparison for the change in perceived volume. So there's another measure to add to the mix to account for this problem of lacking a comparison for how we perceive changes in volume. This is Sones. Sones tell us subjectively how much louder something sounds. Starting at 10 fawn, which is just above the threshold of hearing, we'd have a value of 0.125 Sones. 20 fawn is 0.25 Sones, and then every 10 fawn increase is a doubling of the loudness. So 30 fawn is 0.5 Sones, and 40 fawn would be one zone, et cetera, et cetera. For practical reasons, we're really good at hearing sounds between 500 and about 4,500 hertz. This is our normal kind of conversation range, ranging from adult males to children. With fawns providing our psychophysical scale of sound, what we can hear is an interaction between sound amplitude and frequency, as illustrated by this graph. Again, this points out the most sensitive frequencies for human hearing for evolutionary purposes, primarily. Another thing about hearing is it changes as we age. As we know from talking to older adults in our lives, they tend to experience some sort of hearing loss as they age. This age-related inability to hear high frequencies specifically is called presbycusis. This is due to a threshold shift where the audible spectrum decreases and we lose sensitivity to high frequency noises. The graph here shows the difference between young adults in blue and old adults in red. The threshold for hearing is the black dotted line. More pertinent to ergonomics and human factors engineering, however, is noise-induced hearing loss. Noise-induced hearing loss is a temporary or permanent loss of the ability to hear due to harmful sounds. Sounds can be harmful based on how long or how loud they are, or a combination of both. Sounds can damage sensitive structures in the inner ear and can cause noise-induced hearing loss. It can be immediate or it can take a long time to be noticeable. It can be temporary or it can be permanent and can affect one or both ears. When hearing loss is temporary, it's due to aggressive and high magnitude bending of the cilia, and they get stuck or paralyzed. One of the most common work-related illnesses in the United States is noise-induced hearing loss. Approximately 15% of Americans between 20 to 69 years old, or 26 million Americans, have hearing loss caused by exposure to noise at work or during leisure activities. 16% of teenagers have also reported some hearing loss caused by loud noises. So what types of noises are causing noise-induced hearing loss? A one-time exposure to an intense impulse sound or by continuous exposure to loud sounds over an extended period of time. Some recreational activities might be target shooting or hunting, snowmobile riding, playing music at high volumes, especially through headphones, playing in a band or attending loud concerts. Harmful noises in the home might be things like lawn mowers, leaf blowers, or woodworking tools. Most noise-induced hearing loss is caused by damage and the eventual death of hair cells. The louder the sound, the shorter amount of time that's required to cause noise-induced hearing loss. The bottom line of this is that long repeated exposure to sounds that are at a decibel level above 85 decibels can cause hearing loss. For work-related purposes, NIOSH recommends a limit of 85 decibels for eight hours to minimize occupational noise-induced hearing loss. Importantly, these recommendations use the weighted decibel scale, which applies weightings based on the associated fawn curve. NIOSH also recommends a three decibel exchange rate so that every increase of three decimals doubles the amount of noise and halves the recommended exposure time. One thing we can do is noise contouring. Noise contouring involves using sound level meters in order to measure the decibel level at various locations in an environment and create a sound contour map. We can map out areas where it's safer to have people working and areas where they might be at more risk. One thing we see is a very high prevalence of noise-induced hearing loss in professional trades. Shockingly, welders are one of the highest instances of hearing loss, but we don't typically think of it as a loud trade. However, they often don't incorporate the use of personal protective equipment because it doesn't seem loud. And a lot of the reason for this is that it's a low frequency noise. So very rarely are you gonna see welders that are wearing proper ear protection, even though welders are exposed to around 91 decibels. Carpentry is another trade with a very high risk of noise-induced hearing loss. Most of the tools are gonna to be well above the 85 decibel limit, 
For instance, a hammer drill is almost 115 decibels, which is about the equivalent of a plane taking off. Additionally, most hearing protection only reduces the decibel level by about 20, so even with PPE, you're going over the limit. But if you can't limit the tool use, then how can we reduce the exposure? The best thing to do is incorporate task variation to reduce the exposure time. Intersperse periods of loud activities with quieter activities and allow your ears time to recover. So this means that we want to lower the exposure time as well as the exposure to high vibration and high muscular load. For instance, an average 25-year-old carpenter has the hearing of an average 50-year-old who has not been exposed to noise. This means that approximately 8 years of carpentry is aging your hearing by an additional 25 years. And if you know any old carpenters, you'll probably realize that most of them are practically deaf. Some of the effects and signs of noise-induced hearing loss can include gradual damage which might not be noticeable until it becomes more pronounced. Sounds become distorted or muffled, you might have a hard time understanding speech, and this is again a result of that temporary paralysis of hair cells. After time, this becomes the new normal and this is now permanent damage. Another thing that you might experience is tinnitus. This is often going to be associated with noise-induced hearing loss. Tinnitus is a ringing, buzzing, or roaring in your ears when there's no actual noise present. This can be related to damage or improper transmission through the sensing organs or the pathways to the brain. Typically, it's going to be caused by loud noise exposures and particularly prolonged loud noise exposures. Another major risk factor of tinnitus is it's actually associated with psychological disorders. People with tinnitus experience much higher levels of depression and anxiety when it's been present for more than five years, and this can affect both your personal life and your ability to function at work. Noise-induced hearing loss is the only type of hearing loss that is completely preventable. We know that exposure to 85 decibels and above can potentially cause damage. We need to wear earplugs, move away from the noise, be alert to the hazardous noises in your environment, and particularly protect the ears of children as they're more vulnerable to noise-induced hearing loss if they start losing their hearing early in life. Additionally, make friends, family, and colleagues aware of the risk factors associated with noise-induced hearing loss and try to limit their exposure to these loud sounds as well. And please have your hearing tested regularly. It's important to have an idea of where your baseline is so you can track whether noise-induced hearing loss is occurring. To get a little bit more into the physiology of noise-induced hearing loss, we want to discuss the temporary threshold shift or auditory fatigue. This is when an exposure to a sound impulse or a continuous loud noise can cause that temporary hearing loss. This will usually disappear within 16 to 48 hours. This intense noise displaces the basal or membrane and causes a lot of bending of hair cells because of the magnitude of the force. This forceful bending leads to overstimulation of the hair cells and causes temporary paralysis. This temporary hearing loss results in an elevated threshold from baseline, meaning you need a louder sound in order to stimulate that minimum threshold of hearing. The hair cells will shift and recover with time, but the paralysis of the hair cells means that they're unable to transmit the signal from the vibration, so you won't be able to hear certain frequencies. Often this is going to be associated with those high frequencies. Now, this temporary hearing loss can last anywhere from two days to two weeks. However, if you haven't started to show recovery after about 48 hours, you've probably received permanent damage. Temporary threshold shift is usually measured about two minutes following exposure to a loud noise to avoid significant sound recovery. We see that temporary threshold shift is usually experienced at frequencies higher than the exposure frequency. So we normally see the greatest threshold shift at around 4000 Hz, which is where we're most sensitive to sound. But we do see it all the way down as well. However, this loss of the however, this loss in the mid-range of 1000 to 4000 Hz is why voices typically sound muffled when you have temporary hearing loss. Some other health effects of noise-induced hearing loss can be due to chronic exposure. So chronic exposure to sounds raises cortisol level as well as other stress hormones. There's some correlation between long-term noise exposure and hypertension, and it may be related to increased risk of myocardial infarction or heart attacks. Roadway noise levels are sufficient to constrict arterial blood flow and increase blood pressure and are also associated with headache, ulcers, fatigue, and vertigo. Another unique aspect of noise-induced hearing loss is that damage to the auditory system can actually result in issues with the vestibular system. The vestibular system encodes linear and rotary acceleration of the head. It senses constant linear acceleration from Earth's gravity and thus signals the brain that head movement has occurred and allows us to track the change in position with respect to that constant gravitational acceleration. 
The vestibular system is responsible for detecting acceleration forces, which allows us to maintain upright posture and balance and controls eye movements relative to the head. The semicircular canals detect angular acceleration or rotation in three axes. Within the semicircular canals, a cristae embedded in a jelly-like material called a cup pola is supported by hair cells that bend and fire in response to head rotation. The vestibular sacs, the utricle and saccule, detect linear acceleration. These have hair cells that are suspended in the jelly-like substance that lags behind when the head moves. Nystagmus is the involuntary movement of the eyes. It's a mixture of slow and fast movements, and it can occur normally when we're tracking a visual pattern. It may also have abnormal nystagmus accompanied with vertigo, which is a sensation of spinning that can lead to dizziness and nausea. Individuals who are exposed to intense noise may have evidence of vestibular pathology only when there's an asymmetrical hearing loss, meaning that one ear is more affected than another. This leads to bilateral asymmetries in signals coming from the vestibular system, which means that the brain can have a harder time interpreting the actual orientation of the head and can lead to the, that sensation of being nauseous. When we're talking about nystagmus, there are two types. Spontaneous nystagmus, which presents spontaneously or without any reason, and positional nystagmus, which presents with a change in body position, specifically a change in position of the neck. Positional nystagmus can be a very good indicator that hearing loss has occurred and is resulting in changes to the signals from the vestibular system. So we can actually measure nystagmus with the head in normal position and then change the head's position by flexing or extending the neck or bending to either side and see if you get a different response. You can tell if somebody's going to end up with vertigo as a result of hearing loss if there's a difference between their normal resting position and when you bend the neck. Symmetrical hearing loss then is much less likely to result in vertigo because it's not causing changes between the bilateral signals from the vestibular system. So for a review, we want to be limiting the amount of noise we're exposed to in the workplace. Again, that level of 85 decibels on the adjusted scale, meaning we've scaled it for the frequency of the sound as well, will help us to limit our exposure to sounds that could produce noise-induced hearing loss.